Hello, today is July 22nd, 2011. We're meeting today with William Irvin at his home in Fort Collins, Colorado. My name is Brad Hoops. I'm the interviewer for the Northern Colorado Veterans History Project. Welcome, William, or Bill, as you like to go by. Thank you uh, for sitting down today to, uh, to tell your story. Thank you for coming and, and meeting me and, and doing this project. Uh, I often thought it, it you know, be nice to tell the kids, but I can't get them to sit down long enough to listen. <laughs> Very good. That's the whole purpose of why I do this. Yeah. But uh, Well, then let's start out uh, right away. Let's start out... Tell us a little bit about yourself, your date of birth, where you were born, a little bit about your family. Okay, I was born in uh, New Albany, Indiana, uh, March 12, 1925, and uh, mother, my mother and father were there. Uh, my mother was there naturally, but anyway, and, uh, I think I haven't, I never figured it out, but anyway, I think after I was born in New Albany, my mother was, was supposed to be working in a, a shirt factory at the time that I was born, and uh, she said that uh, she took me to the grandparents to, to raise, because she was young, frilly, and 17 or 18 years old at the time and so she dropped me off at the grandparents and the grandparents decided that was too much of a work job for them so they took me down to Louisville over to Louisville and put me in an orphanage over there mm. and so I was in an orphanage there and then I was finally uh, adopted out but it was on those bases where the, my mother had never signed off. And in the, in the course of the time when I was in the orphanage, it wound up that uh, she married my dad. I call him dad because actually he took the place of the one that was supposed to be there. And uh, so they decided that they weren't having kids. So they come down to get me. Well, they came down and got me, took me. I was pretty happy on the farm. They come and got me and took me. I went to leave with with them then. And so that was my. I was just just about the age to start school, first grade or kindergarten, something like that. So I was a pretty young kiddo, and uh, so then with mom and dad, we li I lived with them until I was 17 years old, and then I wanted to join the Navy, and it had been my aspiration all the time to go join the Navy. Now, why? Here's this Midwest boy from Landlock, Indiana. How did you? Uh, what did uh, the Navy? How did the Navy appeal to you? Uh, uh, well, we moved to in the, in. In 35, I don't know why, but I, I just had this uh, uh, desire to be a sailor. And uh, I read all the books I could, you know, on Hor Horatio Hornblower stories and stuff like that. And, and I, I, I just wanted to be a sailor. I don't know why, but... And then uh, when I went to start school, we went to school and we had ROTC, junior ROTC there in Chattanooga. And uh, I was wearing an army uniform all the time in school, which I thought was a real great idea because, you know, got dressed up every, every three days a week. Got dressed up in the uniform, not only that, but I had his clothes to wear. <laughs> You know, <laughs> well, that leads to a question. During that time period, uh, do you have much memory, and, and was your family affected much by the Great Depression? Well, yeah, in a way, because we lived in Fremont, and it was a agricultural town, sort of like you know, all the farmers outside, cabbage, big cabbage. Because I I know one time, 
to another guy and I always jumped on the back, back of the wagon and stole cabbage. <laughs> and, and we ate the cabbage and you know what we did that night? <laughs> My mother couldn't understand why we, I was flooding the bed. <laughs> but anyway, that was just one of the, you know, deals about uh, going to school and then they had a time of with me in school. They had nailed down the chair, the, had the old sky sliding chairs, and so they nailed one down and put me in it. <laughs> and and uh, like when I was in the nurse hall, uh, in the hall, home orphanage, they took the took it to the dentist or something, and uh, they took them about four of them to get put me in that chair and get me there. So I was a pretty wiggly little boy <laughs> in, in that respect, but. Other than that, you know. Well, now do you remember where you were and what you were thinking when you heard about Pearl Harbor? Yes, I know right where was at. We lived on a trailer. You know, we had a trailer in Chattanooga, and we were living on this trailer park. And uh, we, there was some people that owned the trailer park. They had a son that was uh, crippled, and uh, he was a real. He really liked the monkey with the radio and and the be a twidget, you know, like uh, cold, most Morse code and stuff like that, you know. And uh, so we was, I was there, in, and I had, paper, had a paper route, and I just got back from the paper route, delivering the papers in that morning. And uh, I can't remember the kid's name, but anyway, he hollered down to me and said, Pearl Harbor has been bombed. That's what came over the radio, you know, fast. And then, now this was in Chattanooga, so time-wise, time time changes, you know. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but anyway, that's where I first heard it. And then the next day, next day we had uh, at school. Everybody got into school, and we heard President Roosevelt speech to the Congress and uh, the Declaration of War. I heard that. And so, and everybody started swinging into that, that. And as far as like the depression stuff, you know, Dad worked. He was working for a Montgomery Ward at the time when I I think we got to I got there. And anyway, it got so bad that they fired him. Had to lay him off. And so then Dad had to start working, and he worked for. And the sugar beet factory was just starting up in the in the fall, you know, and so he went and shoveled coal for the for the thing. And then on the, and then about that time, when 40-hour week came in, where a guy could only work 40 hours, so another guy could come in and work 40 hours, you know, and so we that come in in effect, which helped Dad. And, uh, but pay wasn't very high at the sugar beet factory. And so dad would work, hitchhike up to Toledo and work, he worked in a shoe store. And, uh, and then he had to, and they worked until about Sunday morning running, because everything was done by hand, you know, checking up how many, how the, what they sold and all that, and or reordering, the reordering deal. Would last sometimes all the way up from one Sunday morning, and then he would get self back, so they had to go to work Monday morning, and the sugar beet factory again. So shoveling so snow, so coal. So, and you know you didn't have you go into the store, and five dollars was about all you could we'd have, you'd have to spend, and you really spent very few, you know, and, and uh, you know, you went in the grocery store and I want one of those or I want one of those and I want one of those and, and you, you know what the prices were right away for you and you added them up so you didn't over budget. And then you, you, we didn't eat a lot and then we went out and we picked, we picked apples, we dug potatoes. And so, 
out on the farms. You could go out and pick yourself. You know, you pick apples, cherry, cherry, and peas, and berries, and you could go out and 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 harvest those. And then we had a real cool basement, and we bought everybody's raising cotton candy, you know, and we made sauerkraut with the old crock and put the weight on top and kept kept it going and, and stuff. And we we did a lot of canning, making a, a, a jar of um, meat, meat and little meat we got. And they made my mom and dad would make a, a, like a stew, then they put it in the jar and hot. Now I know what they was doing, but those days I didn't. They just they put it in a, a deal and put the lid on it, and then pretty soon they take it out and put it down in the basement, you know. Then come uh, during the winter there, they break one of those jars out, and that's, that was our supper. Oh, supper. Well, yeah. You know, I mean, what's the word I want? Funeral? Yeah. Very. Yeah. Dad was. And so it was. Dad decided we were going to move, and so we moved out to uh, by Camp Perry, and Dad, <coughs> and between Dad and the Grandpa, they got enough money, and so they, Dad went. We had this uh, station, two two pump gas station, good off gas in those days, and we specialized in fish sandwiches on that there. That was we moved to. It was a set, Tus River. It runs out to the Lake Erie, and uh, in the winter time they used to take the water from the river, saw it up. We had to behind the the building we lived in. They had a ice house, and wow. they had it full of all sawdust. And you bring the ice up and dump it in there. I'll be done. But 35 was real wicked winter, so we missed that one because we went to Florida and uh, lived. My my uncle and my wife's, my mother's brother would be my uncle, and they moved to Florida and invited us down there. So we, that's where we went. We moved to Florida that year in 35. And, and is that where you went to high school then down in Florida? No, I went to high school in, in Chattanooga. Oh, Chattanooga, okay. okay. So you, you had mentioned you entered the Navy at age 17, correct? Your, so your folks had to sign for you? Yeah. And they had, had? Dad signed. Did they have my any? Mother, my mother wouldn't. wouldn't okay, sign. that was my next question. Did they have any yeah. problem with that? So. Yeah, well, Dad, Dad signed for me. And, uh, and, uh, and I also joined the Sea Scouts, not the Boy Scouts. I joined the Sea Scouts. In, in, in St. Petersburg, and we had a boat. We had a whale boat. Uh, actually, it was an old time Liberty launch. You know the big one where the, mm -hmm. you see the guy with a tiller, our, our, his hand on the tiller. You know, uh, the steering, the tiller. And uh, they, they somehow or other, one of the clubs got one of the used ones, and then we. Put a deck on it and knocked out the the cross beams, you know, for the seating. And we made <clears throat> they made a little cabin, two masted thing that we sailed around. <clears throat> and if we didn't sail, we had to. I don't know if you ever see the old wheel deal or the oar propulsion. Well, we young boys, you know, and, and we went on a trip down the the bay there in Tampa Bay. The mullet key down that way, and we got down there. And we we was come back, going to go back home, and it, well, the tide was going that way. And we was trying to go that way, you know. And one of the mothers got scared and called a coast guard to come down and look for us, see which way we were going, whether we were going out to sea or not, the Gulf of Mexico. And anyway, so they come and pulled us back up to to the pier. We had our our building was I, I can't remember what club one of them, Optimus or something like that was our sponsor you know and they built a a clubhouse for us there and 
pier, pier for the boat and stuff like that. And uh, you ever been to St. Petersburg? I haven't. No. Well, anyway, no. that's where we. I that was my biggest desire, be a sailor, and that was. And a matter of fact, I played hooky. The HMS, Her Majesty's ship Orion, pulled into uh, cruiser, pulled into uh, St. Petersburg and anchored out there. And, and during the week, they had excursions. And a couple of boys, we played hooky. And we went out to see the boat. Wow. wow. We went out to see the ship. Yeah. And uh, I got called called up on that one. <laughs> you don't play hooky. <laughs> well then, so long, uh, how much longer then after you enlisted in the Navy did you ship out to to uh, to basic? I mean, after oh, you, after you... I signed I signed up, and uh, I think I signed up on Monday or something like that, and, my, and I caught the train out of St. Petersburg to Jacksonville, be sworn in. I think it was Wednesday, by Wednesday. In other words, it wasn't waiting. And we got there Wednesday, they swore this in, and the guy said, well, they had so many openings out to, to the bay, at the boot camp there, and uh, you could go home if you wanted to, or you could go to the boot camp. <laughs> I wanted to go to the boot camp. Oh, I don't want to go back home. <laughs> God, I was trying to get away, just to get out there. <laughs> now, did you enlist by yourself or with some buddies, or? I just... Uh, there was one other guy went with, with, with me, but uh, it w we were friends, but we're not buddies or anything. Yeah, yeah, okay. Like that. Okay. No, I, on my own. And then we had a boot camp in Jacksonville, Florida, and uh, out at the air station there, Naval Air Station, at this boot camp. And uh, so I went, took boots there, and I, they said I was make a good cook, so boom, they put me over here in this barracks, just right across the street. The, the boot camp was one square, big big square block with all the buildings in it, you know, the big old uh, World War II type buildings, two decks, you know, two deck buildings. And uh, they moved us over here, and we, so we went back and started cooking over here where we, uh, was feeding me boots before, <laughs> so we just moved over to, over to the next deal, and uh, I was this buddy and I was Cook and I was we were going to uh, go to the PX, and uh, we were sitting in the bunk there, and this yeoman come in and said they need some cooks, they need some cooks, and we were just going to get our graduation and they were going to bring in a whole bunch of waves in to go to cook school there. And so the, the class before us had went to Great Lakes, Lake Erie, no, Lake Michigan, uh -huh. where they have this, uh, at Chicago there, they have this paddle wheel, they made an aircraft carrier out of it, flat top for learning practice and stuff like that. And anyway, they shipped all them guys up up there to like to, sh by the Chicago up there in that area. And I didn't want to go that way. I want to go that way. <laughs> and so they got you know, the only come in and says, they were looking for cooks. I'm right here, <laughs> right here. And volunteered right there and then there. And so I got uh, run through the physical there on, at, uh, uh, Jacksonville, and I was on my way. Went to good, went to went to cooks went to, went to boot camp, cook school, submarine school, new construction. Got the boat, new construction boat out of uh, Portsmouth, New Hampshire, and then uh, that was the pilot put that in commission. And then we went, went down, took took the route, the route down through the canal. Well, let's back up because uh, you're, you're skipping over some pretty important stuff here. So you went to mess or to, to cook school, yeah. and then you said to submarine school. Now, how how did that route come about? How did you get into because the well, summer? I volunteered to go to 
Cooked it. For the cooks. Uh huh. And so, but you, to go out on the boat, you had to go through government school. So you wanted to be on a submarine, or yeah? Oh, okay. That was your goal. No, was... I don't know. It was. It was. I wanted to get out of cook school. Oh, oh, oh! I see. Oh, okay. I wanted, oh, I thought cook you. Cook school was over. Oh, okay. And uh, we were going to be. It was going to keep us there, to train these all these ways. Oh, oh, okay. Oh, I see. So you went to cook school there in Jacksonville. Yeah. Right. Oh, okay. I said, and, we and... went from this bear, from okay. this building, to that building. It was on the, not the same block. But next one over, yeah, in in Jacksonville there, they had that cook school there. So. Okay, so and then that's when the submarines came. Uh, the to the young men come by, oh. come in the barracks, and said they were looking for cooks for the submarines. Gotcha. Okay. Hey man, here I am. Well, now talk, I didn't know what it was. Sub yeah, talk I about that. I knew what a submarine was a lot looked like, because when it pulled up, <clears throat> the first submarine we lost in World War Two. Had sailed in there. So, Bill, where we left off, uh, you, uh, a yeoman came through and was looking for volunteers for the uh, submarine, uh, cooks for the submarines. Yeah. Well, you had to, you had to qualify. Well, that's what I was going to say. That was a very uh, intent, type program, very hard to get into. Yeah. Uh, talk a little bit about that and how, the process. Well, you had to go through the psycho, psych, psychology, psychological deal, and then the medical and uh, on kind of months and long, you had all your mm -hmm. teeth and all that jazz, you know. But actually, it wound up that it was actually. You had to have all your teeth. <laughs> anyway, anyway, you, and the, the doctor said, "Well, if you were, if you were, I had an overbite, a little overbite, you know." And so the doctor said, "Well." You're that eager to go, he says, I'm, I'm, I'm willing to send you on, on your way. <laughs> so he, he, he that, the medical doctor okayed everything for me. And away I went to New London, Connecticut. Got orders, set, set orders to go to New London, Connecticut. So I went to sub-school in New London. Went to, to go to sub-school, go to training. And I went, went out training on O-boats. O-boats were first World War submarines. 30 feet, 30 feet pressure. <laughs> they were riveted, riveted, you know, and they, we had, they had some there in New London, and they'd take them, it was actually uh, a rock, a break-in, you know, to go to the bigger boats, you know, fleet boats, and, but just to give you a taste of it, you know, they, you get everybody, and you could go out and go 30 feet deep, they pull a plug and you sink down 30 feet, 40 feet, and it, well, how they, whenever they stopped it. <laughs> and then you get back up the top side, you know. Now during all the, all this training, did you ever think to yourself, wait a minute, this may not be for me or? Oh no. Really? No, I liked it. This I was <laughs> proud. I was a proud cock. I was on submarines. You know, then you always say, what are you going, what are you doing? I'm on submarines. Oh, I wouldn't be on one of those. Yeah. And uh, I said, I like it. And I did. I, I, I enjoyed it. That was my favorite duty, submarines. I, I, I did wind up also in my career, I wound up on an APA, a troop transporter. And, uh, but it, it was nothing like submarines. I'll be done. I, well, one thing I would think that, that was a nice part about it, we had a small crew, we got to know everybody, you know everybody, from the captain right on down, was all on speaking terms, you know, no matter what, you know, it was really a small, you knew who the captain was, yeah, yeah. the exact, and who the commissary officer was, and the gunnery officer, you knew all these people. You know, where you get on a big ship, you don't know about it. Right, right. Except the boats made. Yeah. Well, I guess, uh, talk a little bit. I, coming from somebody that's never been on a submarine, I, I guess I I have these feelings of claustrophobia and, and the confines. Talk about the, talk about, talk about the submarine, the, the environment of the submarine, the, uh, if you could, a little bit about what it's like to be in a submarine as far as physically being in a submarine. Well, you get a bunk, and it's, uh, 
that wide, and about six feet long, <laughs> and they they fold the bunks up like that. You know, they come up like that, and the, then you got walkway, passageway, and the one on the, on the outside go up against the outer hull, and the, out, and the port side, same thing, and uh, the galley, the galley is about that long and about that wide. Wow. That's the galley. The galley you got two 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 stoves. Two stoves. Electric. Everything's electric. And you got two stoves there. And the ovens are amazing. And in between the stoves you got a deep fat fryer. And uh, pans hang up here and the racks up here for your pans. And then, then in the in the in the stove there, they got a riot rays on the side, and uh, and then we also had one big huge plate that we aluminum that we could sit down inside there, like for frying eggs and stuff like that. Anything it run, and then. We had the pots that were this high, so that it could make stuff like that this high. And in the case you get an up and down angle, okay. you know, we had room to, or else you had it all over the galley. And the salt shaker was in the, underneath the, the ovens. And you turn around, on the corner here was a coffee pot going 24 hours a day, and uh, coffee. Coffee cups were right there, right across the way, and then we had a a bin, a bin. It was a flip, come out like this, and there was one for coffee, sugar, flour. That was the coffee, sugar, and flour. And then up here, top side, about this high, we had pie racks. We could make pies, slip them in there. And then we also had in between there the work beams was here our work and across the port side was the sink, our sink. And uh, and then we stored uh, the ice box was right. Not the ice box wasn't underneath to me. I was I was standing on a hundred and twenty shells. Five inch shells. <laughs> <Wow>. <laughs> underneath me. <laughs> the armory was right underneath me. And then the ice box was over here. And then we had two. We had an ice box. And it was just about that. That size. size. You had to load that up with, for enough for 60 to 90 days supplies. Now, how, how big of a crew did you cook for? Now, so, well, 90, about 90 people. 90? And then we cooked the whole, the captain right on down. Everybody ate the yeah. same thing. Yeah. Except sometimes the war, the the stewards up there would fix little deals, little deals for the the crew the officers, you know. But everybody else from chief on down, and they got the same food because they the stewards come back and get it and carry it up forward. Just different, but they put it in different uh -huh. containers. Okay. Same stuff, yeah. but different container. Well, from what I understand too, the the submarine uh, always got had great food, had very yeah. good food. Yeah, you could, you could very well screw it. You could screw it up though. Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. you know, but you, we try not to. Yeah, we we try to fix, fix real good food. We ate every four hours. You could eat every four hours because the crew watches the four hour anything. And uh, so every time the watch come on and going off, you, if they if they slept through the breakfast, they would want something for dinner. Then at four o'clock in the afternoon, when they got off of that, they could eat again. See, we had soup, soup and stuff at four in the afternoon, and then or after supper, you had to get it all cleaned up so they could have movies. And we had our movies in there, and uh, so. Well, was there more than one cook? I mean, surely yeah, we had we had we had two cooks and we had crew of three. 
We had two cooks and, a, and we had a chief, two cooks, uh, Knox and I, and uh, Jim Crow was the chief cook, chief in charge. And uh, he did the bacon at night. He worked every night. I worked every, he worked every other day. You get up at six, six to seven in the morning, and you didn't get off till six or seven at night because you you had all you had breakfast to get out, dinner to get out, supper to get out. Yeah, it sounded like it was a twenty-four and hour operation, yeah, pretty much. Four, and in between time, you had to have the soup out at four o'clock in the afternoon too. And then they work at the same thing at night. The baker would do some get stuff out for them at midnight too. Hmm. So they didn't go hungry. It was always there, open, open meal, open, open ice box, really call it. And we tried, and uh, when we first got during the war, first we took the ice box. We had two showers back in the in the after battery, and we put a great, a great wooden grate on above the shower, you know. And then we put, put stored potatoes. That's where we stored the potatoes. We had during the first part of '43, we were still using raw potatoes, you know. And did you ever clean it? We're all mess. They are the messiest, stickiest, gooey stuff you ever had. Hmm. Rotten potatoes. Oh. Oh, they smell. Anyway, and the head was here. Four space was here. Two showers were here. And we didn't have no water. The only thing we made, we made water for the batteries, battery water. They got the, the batteries got the water. The crew didn't. Oh, <laughs> but they always say, it was and then they like these not, not nuclear boats where they get, they got a thing that makes water coming out of their ears, you know? Yeah, yeah. And they take a sailor, the old submarine World War II sailor getting on them living the lap, lap of luxury, you know, but. Yeah, yeah. Well, what, you said you would work a 12-hour shift. What would you do on, uh, on with your free time? Um, sleep mostly, or what would you do to next entertain day, yourself? Next day you, you do book. Yeah, I, uh, later on I got to doing book work, you know. You do it. You figure out how much you use, you use in the day, and you had to keep records, and, uh, or or stores and stuff later on when you got back in port and stuff like that. But anyway, it, other than that, if you was off, you was off. Except that usually half the time they was, had to have a. So when you were weren't on duty, uh, what did you do to entertain yourself? You mostly slept, or was there what? What did people do to to, well, to fill time? Well, somebody off watch, you know, and we'd have little card games. Dominoes, dominoes are real common. common. Cribbage, cribbage game, you know, play cards. And uh, after payday, it was poker, you know. But and I learned my lesson. Well, <laughs> you don't play payday for poker, and pay, pay, you get paid. I, I, love, I played poker. I always the guy had something better than I had. And so when payday, next day was payday. This was not at sea, but I mean in port. And so I got paid. I paid that guy off. I had five dollars left. I took that five dollars, bought my cigarettes, and then I stayed aboard. I didn't go ashore. I stayed aboard for two weeks. And then I got paid again. And then I could go ashore. But I stayed aboard for two weeks on that five hours. And because I had movies and stuff, so. And, but I just wasn't going to get in debt. We had a. I tell you how good it was. We, had, we made a slush fund on boat on the boat too. Put thirty dollars in it in the slush fund. 
I think I got $140 back on that slush fund when it, and they had to break it up every so often, you know, because it got too big. And them guys were forever borrowing 10 or $20, you know, and they had to pay it back because usually the chief of the boat was in charge of it. And you didn't go by him without playing him, you know, so that's what kept it good. Uh -huh. And, uh, but anyway, it was worthwhile. The guy did some, some, sometimes people needed it real bad, you know, but just to go over. I used, I worked with this one cook, and if he didn't have 30 or 40 dollars on him, he wouldn't go ashore, you know. He needed that much to get drunk on. Yeah. But anyway. Yeah. Well, let's let's take your story now. Uh, so okay. you you went uh, to submarine school. You got uh, assigned to the to the pilot, pilot fish, and then you said you headed down uh, through the uh, Panama. Well, after, after we after we spent the time with this fire and the torpedo, and the, the old man gave us thirty days, it was two weeks two weeks vacation, and so I went to Florida, down to Florida see my folks. Mm -hmm. I got a picture of one of the, it's not a very close picture, it's just me standing on the mailbox. Anyway, and so then we want to come back, but then we took down, we took a loaded up in New London and we took the trip. They had a path going down, I don't know if you ever remember reading it, probably not, but Airedale said, sight of the sub, sank same. And it was with us, not one of ours. They, they, they goofed up on that. We had a regular deal, you know, laid out on the mat, on the charts, you know, and then we could go from New London to all the way down to Panama. On, and that thing, the safe zone, it was just called safe zone, you know, so that if anybody seen anything in that, it, was, it wasn't. It was us, not the Germans. Oh, okay, gotcha. Okay. Not the Germans, you both. But anyway, got down there. How? What was it like going through the Panama Canal? Oh, we had a ball, and I had to do. I had off duty. I didn't have the duty that day. Anyway, and we went to the the lake down there. Fresh water. We all went down in the superstructure, took our took our soap, <laughs> and had a bath. <laughs> Fresh water bath. And when we got on, on the Pacific side, we tied up and we were even with the dock. We had liberty, it was liberty on, on the Panama side, I mean on the Pacific side. We had liberty there and you had to be back by midnight. You know. Come back at midnight and all you could see was top of the shears. Tide was down, uh, up and down that fast. And the four, four guys on watch, they had to have two guys on watch to help loosen up the lines because it was driving that fast, you know. And uh, you had to, before we just walked off the, on the gangway, huh. Bef coming back they had to climb, climb down the Jacob ladder to get, get on board. But anyway, and uh, certain places of Earth are like that, but that Panama's. On the Pacific side, you really got a quick drop. Yeah. So then from Panama, then we where did you... Went to Pearl. Went to Pearl? Did you guys know your assignment? Did you know you were heading to Pearl? Or oh, yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, we knew yeah. where we were going. Oh, okay. we, was, we were assigned to the Pacific Fleet. Mm -hmm. Now, where were you, you going? traveling in a, uh, in a convoy, or were you by no, yourself? By yourself. By yourself? And would you travel underwater the whole time, or no. would you... Oh, okay. Okay. No. We never got there that way. Oh, okay. <laughs> We we only go about nine knots that way. Before that, other than that, you get better better mileage. Anyway, we went to Pearl, and I didn't know it about the time, but in the in the World War Two books, the books we got called World War Two, and I don't know if I got one up here or not. But anyway, they got one. They made a story about how we top copied the German. Tactics of uh, wolf pack. Mm -hmm. So I, I knew we went out with two other boats, but I wasn't thinking about a wolf pack. But anyway, the first patrol we went on was a wolf pack, and it was the other two boats and us. Well, it so happened 
we just invaded Guam and Saipan and Tinia. That's when we got there. And we went to the end above them between Japan and them. And so here comes this convoy. They picked us up. We had a squeaky screw. They picked us up and we went to 400 feet. And they dropped the death charges and stuff. And uh, they, they've, the, the convoy churned right in front of the other two boats. <laughs> bang, bang, boom. Yes, <laughs> they sunk them. <laughs> in other words, we sunk. That saved the, all them guys from getting to the to Guam and Taipan, Tinia, you know. So that that less less they had to fight. Yeah, right, right. So what was it like? Describe what being under a, a depth charge attack is like. Well, first thing, it, it, it's one of these things, it's one of these things, how do you describe an accident? How can you describe an accident? You got in a car accident. I'm going to say, how can you describe it? You got an accident. Well, just trying to describe a death charge is about like that. You're going silent running, it gets hot, no air conditioning. And the only reason they put air conditioning on the boat was for the, for the equipment. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. They put it on, they had to have it, equipment for, air conditioning for the equipment. It wasn't for the personnel. But anyway, that's why we always kidded them, you know. Anyway, we go to the depth chart, and I sit there with a set of air foams on, a little squawk box, you know. I was in the after battery. My, my that's sister, where your general quarters was? Yeah, okay. general quarter. After battery with a set of air foams on. And you sit there, and you had this Formica bunk bed, I mean Formica on the seating arrangements, and you sit there and wait, pretty soon you hear, you, you can hear, hear the screws, uh, the, 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 whoever's dropping them, mm -hmm. tin cans or who, or who it is, and then you hear the blue splash, you hear kind of, and all of a sudden you hear, click, boom, that's the death charge. And you can count them, click, boom, click, boom, you can count them, keep track of them. And uh, so it wasn't too bad. Some, one boat, they pounded the hell out of it, you know, they practically sunk it with just that charge, but she finally uh, recovered enough. She got out of the, uh, got away from them. From, and then we went in and relieved her. But that was another tale, you know. And so that's hard. It is, it's hard to describe a death charge. Mm. I don't know if you've seen it, seen it on TV, probably, you know. That's just about a, about, you, you can hear, but then also, you know, you can't get out. You can't yeah, right, work. right. Yeah. You're not going to get out. Do you just kind of resign yourself to that fact, or yeah, right? yeah. okay? You you know yourself. Yeah. You know yourself. They, when you as you come down the ladder, you know that uh, that was it. That's it. You're either going to go out all all or none. You know. Well, well, we know now just how dangerous the submarine service was back then. Did you guys know how dangerous? Were you told how dangerous? I mean, the the losses were amazing and. And it was, a, it was a very dangerous branch to be in. Did, were you aware of that back then? It didn't really bother you. Really, yeah? No, I mean, you, you were assigned a boat, you were on a boat, and that was it. And you could get off if you wanted to. You, all you had to say was, I want off. They'd take you off, no sweat. Because there was two guys over here waiting to get on their boat for you. Huh. Wow. So. You know, and they paid us more. Yeah. You know, they paid us check more, and so, not 
Not that you really realize it, but anyway, it was a good way to. Yeah, yeah, you know. yeah. And I, I, I come out of high school. I put twelve, thir I put thirteen years in high school. Or twelve, twelve. I skipped. I stayed in third grade twice. You know, mm -hmm. I didn't get out of third mm -hmm. grade. Fell back. Uh -huh. I stayed there. I fell in love with the teacher. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I always say. Yeah. That. I don't like to say I was so dumb. I stayed there. But anyway. <laughs> anyway, that's what it was. And so I had figured I had twelve years of education, you know. And so after the war, I wrote to the principal in Chattanooga, and they sent me up this poem. Oh, is that right? Oh, wow. Well. I, I told them all the schools I went to, and, uh -huh. I, uh -huh. and then during the war, I took out a course from, from a university. I can't remember, I think it was Pennsylvania University. They were giving courses out, you could take courses, and I took a course out in literature and English, you know. And then during my on the day off, I, it was, we would submerge, I'd go back in the engine room, and hot go back there and work on it. But anyway, uh. just had a good bunk, I mean a good seat. Actually it was a tool seat, the toolbox <laughs> that had a seat on. And uh, things like that, you know. Uh. So I I told them, you know, submarine school, cook school, boot camp, submarine, cook school, submarine school, new construction school. Qualifying, you had to qualify to get the dolphins. Oh right, yeah. <laughs> you had to qualify to get these, and so that's what that that means. So yeah. you guys were based out of uh, out of Pearl Harbor then. That was our home base at home the base. time. How many how many missions did you go out during but, the war? Oh, I, I made five runs. Five runs. The first run we went to Majuro Atoll down in, and we when we left after we got up after we left the wolf pack, the other two guys went back to Pearl. We went to Majuro and we got down there we very lucky. We were just about to run out of fuel. Mm. But anyway, Majuro we spent two two weeks. I just one thing they did for all the submariners. After you come back on a run, you two weeks vacation, two weeks off of the boat. Mm -hmm. You stay off the boat, and then you go back and start start retraining because you get usually every every run <clears throat> at, at the end of at the end of every run. We'd lose certain percentage of guys. Okay. They'd swap. Mm -hmm. And so you get new guys, so then you had to train to train them. Usually, usually the young younger people, you know, coming. And uh, even the older ones, you know, each each boat has its own particular way of doing things. So mm -hmm. each skipper was good. I had two good skippers, close, Captain Close and Captain Schnabel. Two good two good skippers. The last one was Snable, and he'd in the cabins, captain's cabin, two bunks, one on top of the other, you know. <clears throat> and somewhere around right, he got a plywood, a piece of plywood, and he put the top bunk up, and that plywood attached to the bottom, bottom of the bunk, and they had all these big glossy pictures like this. So we. We were lucky, you know. Main thing, we were lucky. We went there and we did what we were supposed to do, and we come back. That's the main thing. The rest of it was you know, some of the boats were better, better equipped, better skippers, and more daring, and all that jazz, you know. And some of them didn't come back. Yeah, right. Yeah. And so, and then they, the Japanese, were getting better at all our stuff, you know, because they were. The Germans were giving them stuff, you know, better equipment to, because if they'd have, if, if, uh, if the Germans had helped them more, they would have 
they had, uh, I got to see, I got to get on a couple of their I boats, their big boats that they, they built these submarines to carry planes. Mm -hmm. And they had a shoot. It was a one way trip for pilots, you know, unless he got back to them and dumped it because they couldn't get it back on. Right, yeah. I don't think they could. Anyway, they could get it, they could launch it, but I don't know about it. And then they started using those eye boats for, they put them full of rubber bags full of rice and stuff and then dump them off of these, some of these islands where these guys were held out. No, no, no release coming, mm -hmm. you know. So anyway, they were split. The boat was split in half. Right down the middle was a bulkhead, and he went, he went this way, not this way. Mm -hmm. Went to that, way. and they had a had a raw rubber in the bottom of the conning tower down to the bridge. And it was that deep, boom. They'd come down, slide down that, that thing, hit that thing. And then they'd jump out of the way because that guy'd be right on top of them. But anyway, it was a good service. Now, when you would go out on a run, how, on average, how long would, it, would a run go for? Well, it depends on what, where you got it and what, what was you doing and stuff. And uh, if you get, sometimes. 40, 50 days. More Is that right? Wow. But you you had you you had to prepare for 90 days. That was that was so that you didn't run out of anything, you know. And certain things you run out of, you know, like the eggs and stuff like that. that we tried to, as long as we could, you know. And then we would revert to to uh, powdered eggs, but mostly powdered eggs for cooking bacon and stuff like that, you know, but we try to and try to get the uh, using fresh eggs as long as we could. But they're bad too. They get bad. Ooh. Huh. Ooh. Then we had to dump trash every day, you know. Yeah, how would you do that? What? Go up through the Connie Dar. It was you had well see you had to surface every night. Every to day recharge the batteries. To recharge the battery. And uh then if you got chasing somebody or trying to get ahead of somebody, waiting for them to come, and then you'd, you'd use a lot of batteries, so you had to get up at night and charge, and as soon as you got topside, everything looked clear and clean. Then the garbage detail would come and take the trash all the way down through the boat, and pick up, and take it up through the kind of tar. Now, when you, when you guys would uh, rise at night to uh, recharge your batteries, would they give you opportunities for the guys to come out and get some fresh air? No. No, not unless you go topside for a lookout. That was your job. If you were the job, uh, you know they they didn't want too many people on on topside to go down. You got to go down fast. Oh, so. okay. No, no. Okay. It wasn't until after the war, then you could go topside. Yeah, yeah. And and that. The only thing, if they were running on the surface, if you volunteered to put our sunglasses on, a big deal, to look under the sun, watch them. So if they were coming, the they, Japs and them figured out, you know, they'd come in, but had the sun behind them come in to you, you know. Oh, okay. So you could go. I went up one time for that. No more. <laughs> they pretty much beat me to death coming down to that hatch. No. Well, how would that be then after after you went out on a forty or fifty day run and come back, and you were two weeks. But I mean, once you got back, did it take a while to adjust to being out of the sub and and like you said, sunlight and on, on the on the on on land? I mean, well, how was that adjustment between? Was it easy to get off the sub and and? Yeah, you just walk down, go, go to the, go to, you know. Like we went to the Royal Hawaiian Hotel, and uh, we went had our room there in two weeks, early liberty. Could, could get out of there at eight o'clock. Otherwise, other ships could be noon time, you know. 
12 to 12. He'd have to be back at midnight. So he'd have to be there at midnight too at the Royal Hawaiian. But anyway, he was right there. And then on Midway, we had a rest camp in Midway. And uh, it was nice. There were no women on that island. No, not a woman one. <laughs> and so everybody was equal. <laughs> and anyway, and uh, we had movies. They had movies 24 hours a day, keep you busy. They had ball games going all the time. And, uh, you know, it wasn't very big rock. Yeah, right. And, you know, but it was nice, clean beach, beach go swimming, all that jazz. But you, you, you learn to ask, you know, do you do your own thing. Yeah. Now, uh, in the submarine, did you guys ever cross the equator? And if so, did you have the same polywag uh, yeah. shellback ceremony? But I didn't do it during the war. Uh. I did it after the war. After the war was over, we went to, after the war, we went down to Lithy and two beers and back. It's called two beers and back. We went, we went down took that road all the way down there. Actually, what happened after the war, we had two divisions of submarines sitting there in, Pearl, in Guam, in Nagania, Guam there. And the only thing we had to do was play tit-tat-toe with other destroyers now, you know. And so they decided the tender was decided. What happened was two tenders, had two tenders there, one guy the captain of this guy had more time than this guy, than this guy here, took his crew and went up to Japan to pick up the I-boats. And uh, he, he, it was his deal. So this one said, well, pooey on you. We're going down here and have two beers and we'll come back and cross the Internet as a date line and have polywogs and all that jazz. And, and they did. And it's what we did. And I got good pictures of me. And, <laughs> Be, becoming a shellback. Yeah. An international dateline, there wasn't nothing on that. It was just the, today's today, today's tomorrow. Yeah. Tomorrow's play, tomorrow's today. <laughs> but anyway, mm. that was, but it, it was fun. And it was comical. And we had the beer of formaldehyde in the mixed in with it, I think. And anyway, it, they, they had a lot of beer. Hmm. We tried to, we had a ball game in a midway there. And so us young bucks were going to drink the, we had one in trough like the water cattle with, you know, uh -huh. full of ice, ice and beer, ice and beer. And we was all going to help drain it, drain it dry. Don't, it's hard on you. Oh man, you got and we got done. We got staggered back to the sponsors. I had, had these sponsor huts and it was hot, hot. Got in a sponsor hut, got up on the top bunk, blah, hotter, you know what, and got sick, got sick, sicker, got sicker and sicker until so finally. I finally staggered outside and heated up everything. <laughs> it, it told me I wasn't a drinker. And it convinced me I just wasn't a drinker. Yeah, yeah. So, uh -huh. it, it was, and you know all the stomachal, Dad had two beer bars, beer bars. And when you used to take a peg, keg and off it, you know. Uh -huh. You get all this foam off of it, you know. And I'd get all that some of that foam in the glass, you know, and salt it down and drink that. Well that really is tall cotton. But that's not the one that happens when you drink the other way. Yeah, right, right. Yeah, right. so and that it was comical. Up in Ohio I kinda liked that. We went to Florida first time we popped the cake down there, I didn't like that one. Huh. That was the end of that, doing that stuff. Yeah. 
How would you do uh, as far as communications from home? You would just have to wait till you got back to port to get obviously to get your mail, and it, yeah. so it build up over time. And yeah, yeah. Even during even during the cold, cold war, there, it, Camille can tell you about that. You give you ten, ten uh, you can send so many little words, but you couldn't send anything else. Oh, uh, so you were censored. Well, to the boat. Oh, 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 I see. Okay, okay, gotcha. Oh, okay, gotcha. Come, let's come to vote. They'd, gotcha. Every night, every day, we get these, once a week we get these messages from home, you know, on, on our, during a patrol. But that was afterwards. That wasn't during That's World after, War II. No. Yeah, yeah. No, they didn't. No, yeah. World War II, no. Yeah. We did, the only thing we got from World War II was, are you done? Have you sunk anything? <laughs> you know, are you with us yet? Wow. Uh, yeah, no, uh, but during the war, co war, well, like that last boat I was on, we figured we had four, four t t uh, missiles. We figured we'd get one off, maybe two, but never three. Wow. Wow. So we did, did four was a standby. <laughs> Where uh, 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 the five runs you made were? Was there any that were worse off than than the others, or anyone, any that stick out in your mind? Any runs that we had? We had Jim Crow had bought a, uh, a hand of bananas, you know, green green bananas. I mean, they were green, green. The whole thing was green. And so he was going to ripen them up. And in the, in the control room on the old boat, there was a hatch going up, gun, set, gun excess hatch going up. And when they had the gun on the forward deck, they had the gun. So he hung the bananas in that gun hatch inside there, you know, to uh, ripen it up. Well, so happened on the run. We went to, uh, we were sitting off of Wake Island, and we were sitting there, sitting there, watching them repair this boat. We wanted to to, to uh, get it done. And then about that time, another boat come by, by, and so the old man was going to finally decide, maybe we need a little action. Well, it was still dark, and so he brought us up, battle stations and all that jazz, you know. Well, they couldn't get that gun set open. Couldn't get it open. It, we were still submerged, like we hadn't gone topside yet. Still submerged. The old man kept looking at that boat, kept looking at that boat, kept looking at that boat. All of a sudden he said, Cancel, cancel, cancel the battle station. The more he looked at it, I think the more he realized it might have been a cue boat, you know. And then we have got surface. We got so I always figured that, that stalk of bananas saved our lives. Wow. Uh -huh. And then when it got topside, we could have got away from there and it could listen to the could get in there from the outside, and there was a stalk of bananas that had dropped. It was rotten off to the, the line, it had dropped down, and so that's why they couldn't get it to open. Huh. So we, we always figured that that thing saved ourselves. Wow. The banana, the banana stalk. Huh. And, you know, it's, it's talking about Iwo Jima after the war. You know, we set off at Iwo Jima for 30 days listening to a bomb at Iwo Jima, day in and day out. And you know, you could, a guy couldn't realize it. There'd be so many people alive on that island, <laughs> alive, still alive, after 30 days of bombing. And we, you know, you, 
Even though they were bombing over here, you still hear it in the water. Is that right? Yeah. It travels. How far off? How far off were you from? I don't know exactly how far off. We weren't too far off. Cause I guess they were watching through the periscopes. Wow. Oh. But so I mean, what were you guys there for? More of a, as a defensive uh, to protect the other ships, or? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thirty days we sit there, and then also we were pick up pilots in case they drop. You know. But I can't. You can't believe how many bombs they dropped on that thing. Mm. That's not a very big island. Yeah. yeah. But anyway. Those are about the biggest, biggest war stories I can yeah. tell you. Yeah. Now, yeah, where were you, where were you when uh, uh, v, VJ Day happened? I was on the USS Lower. Oh, you transferred ships? Yeah. yeah see, I transferred uh, five runs. I got. I was part of that crew that got transferred. I went to sub, I went to the relief crew on the fender. See. We, the tender crew, and then we had a relief crew that took care of the boats. And so we were working on the boat. And so we worked on the pilot fish and got her ready to go back to sea. And then so we was just about ready to go to that and took my time off there and I got orders to go to the blower, resident blower. And so I was on the blower on DJ day. And, uh, if they had stayed, if I stayed on it, then on six runs, see, and so, but I did five, five runs. They were, they liked that other cook better. <laughs> 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 well, I, I, I done five runs on it, so that was enough. Yeah, yeah, sure. And then so we, I rode the blower. We went to, we went to uh, the beer, beer bus two beers and go home. And Skipper on the blower was a famous football player for the Navy. I can't remember his name. But anyway. So where we left off, Bill, uh, the war came to an end. Uh, was there any sort of celebration? Do you remember that day? Were you, was there a big celebration or a relief that you had made it? Uh, any that was the, that was the main thing. We lived through it. Yeah. Then we decided what we we're going to do. How how many points did you have? How soon could you get out? What happened was that they had so many boats out, they had to wait and ro rotate them to get back. See, we had two squadrons there in Guam, and they had some boats that were still set, sitting at Midway, and. And then they had the whole two squadrons there and, and Pearl, see, so, and then they had boats still coming across or coming back that was heading this way, uh, you know, heading for Pearl. So they took, and then all the other destroyers and all that stuff, everybody was trying to get out and be the first to school and all that jazz, you know, and, and uh, so. It was quite a quite a deal trying to figure out. So I didn't have enough points at that time. So we rode her right. We rode her, and then finally, really hurt, hurt my feelings. But I don't know. Did you ever see a Black Widow plane? And mm -hmm. Black mm -hmm. Widow plane. P sixty one. Yeah. They was bringing those things in, putting them on a putting on a barge. Taking them off the airplane, off of the freighter, putting them on this barge, and then they barge the tug would take the barge out to sea, and dump them. They didn't even take the howling off or nothing. They just took them. Up. They bring it. They was bringing them there to use them. In Guam, because Guam was just nothing but a, a depot. Had all the men and Marines and equipment and everything there, waiting for them to load up, keep loading up these ships, get to load them up and take them out to sea. And the 
waiting for the big push. Because it was coming. And then it always it always hurts me when I hear people complaining about them dropping the A-bomb. And uh, they don't realize what it was slaughter it would have been like. And because they, they had they had two prime examples of die to die for the emperor on Okinawa and Iwo Jima. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I mean, the, 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 and anybody that tells me that, I I get so frustrated for the stupidity. I know it wasn't nice to do it, but they started this daily thing and they had to take the consequences. And the treatment that the troops got, you know, all during the war was, you know, the POWs and stuff. It's just one of the deals that's so, so unbelievable. Yeah. yeah. Now, how, how much longer then were you in uh, after the war ended before you finally got your discharge? Well, we got all we, we got water all the way back in and, and we got the tender, tied up to tender, yeah, dropped the tender, dropped anchor out there and we swung on the buoy out there in the middle of the Tamp, uh, San Diego Bay there. And uh, I can't remember exactly how many days, but anyway, I finally got discharged, joined the 52, 5220 Club. Okay, which, what, to, for those that are watch this, was, you got $20 a week? 52 weeks. 52 weeks, okay. You know, you know what it is? Uh -huh. Where'd you hear it? Oh, I've just heard it through many stories with other veterans, yeah. Oh, the other he's guys? Done, he's done yeah. about 260 of these. So. Yeah. But he, a lot of people don't know what it was. Yeah. Yeah. But anyway, and so we went, at, while I was off, we went, took, went down to Florida, got the stuff for mom and dad, and uh, I bought a car and a Dodge. Well, let me interrupt you there. Uh, I imagine your folks were glad to see you uh, when you got home. Was it a great homecoming to to come home and and and, and it and being on mediocre. the summer being mediocre. Oh, okay. Well, actually, they had moved from Florida to California. To yeah. Oh. Oh. Okay. Yeah. So they, they were there. Moved, they moved. No. Go ahead. They moved over to California. So, and then Jack got there before I did. Jack was my buddy from Tennessee. And he got there before I did, so, he, you know. He got the well, Royal Well. You know. <laughs> okay. Anyway, what, I mean, it, it was. What he's, it was well, I think you're missing what, what he's trying to tell you is on the ship, when you heard that the armistice had been, went, that they were going to sign and, you know, that the war was over, what did, what did, did the crew, were they, you know? Or was it just another day? <laughs> just another day. Is that right? Yeah. yeah. Just another day. Yeah. But the only thing, the only thing good about it was everybody started sitting down and started to figure out how many days, yeah. how many right. days they yeah. had, yeah. or how soon they could get out and all that. Yeah, you know. And the ones that, like, it was Kitty Cruz in six months. You know, see, I was on in the war in six months. I could have stayed in six months longer. You know. Anyway. So you're back home now, or you're back with your folks, you're in the 5220 Club, you bought a car. Take your story from there. Went to Florida and got it, picked up a trailer, brought this stuff back from Florida to California for my dad and mom. And then I, uh, then I started working at an aircraft factory down there in Lakewood, California. Uh, they were building Cowan for the B-29 planes, you know. Mm -hmm for the engines, and they also built in a fighter. They're working on this fighter plane, a brand new one. And what happened was, all them guys come in one morning and they had pink slips on their, on their left time cards. They fired the whole bang. Everybody that worked on that plane got fired that day because they lost a contract. Hmm. And I thought to myself, I don't think I want to like, like work with it this year. I want a little more security. <laughs> I'm going back in the Navy. Is that right? Yeah. And that's when I went back in the Navy. 
And I come out first class and went back in as seaman first class. And I had to start all over again. All the submarine cooks stayed in. <laughs> yeah, that's right. A lot of they had we had too many cooks. Uh -huh. And uh, then they got us. Uh, later on, they got an opportunity. Anybody want to swap rates? They could swap rates. Go to another type of rate. You know, I, I was too dumb to go the other way. I stayed cooking. But I liked it, and I, I knew what I was doing. Did Did you want to go back to the subs then as well? Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, actually, when I went back in, I got transferred to North Island, San Diego. So at San Diego and North Island had a green field down by the border. And green field was a training place. They had the, they had the earth strip laying, laid out like a carrier top you know, the deck on the carrier, and they would, the guys would tr practice uh, on that, you know, landing and mm -hmm. taking off. And then they had a helicopter squadron there. It just started, you know, helicopters. Yeah, new. Become popular, mm -hmm. you know. And so they were starting that. So I went down there, and finally I talked and talked and talked to some of the right people, and so they got me transferred back to the submarines. Sure. And uh, I got sent back to Mare Island, picked up the Segundo. And then we were going to make a cruise. We made a cruise from San Diego to Pearl. Pearl, the uh, Brisbane, Australia. And only, only Americans ship in port. And what a deal that was. Seven days. They had to, at night they had to chase the girls off. <laughs> <laughs> they did. Yeah. Honestly. The, the, the OD, the OD would come through at night and, and after, I think it was nine o'clock at night or something, come through and it, every, all the girls had to go. And uh, so, but it was seven days of heaven, <laughs> and we had a great time there. Then we left there and went to Tsingtao, China, and uh, they 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 they'd get some of the Japanese destroyers that they had left to the Chinese, you know, and uh, uh, the nationals Chinese, and not the the. Communist. Communist. And uh, then I could see how they had so many death charges. They had the death charge racks on both sides, port and starboard, and they went all the way up to be right next to, underneath the bridge, the full length of the boat. And it went, and the fantail went just like that, right down into the water. Hmm. And boy, they just pulled up in, boom, 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 boom to roll them off just fast as a whip. But anyway, that's where we got to see that. And then also we saw one day this, we were there, this ferry boat, like, and I don't make, I don't think they had a, that much water between the, the water and the deck. I mean, it was loaded down with poor Chinese boys. I mean, they were loaded to the gill. And it comes steaming into the harbor there. And at nighttime, you could hear them shooting cannons off on, off, off on the hills there, out of the town. Thank goodness. But anyway, that was Sing Tower. That was, that was a town that German, German had taken, you know, over sort of like uh, Hong Kong. You know, oh, okay. Took oh, okay. Hong Kong, uh, okay. And Macau took. Portuguese. Portuguese, see. And so in in town there they had a sta they had a station just like the one in Frankfurt. Hmm. Train station in in the same town. And anyway, we spent time there and then we went come back to Pearl and back home. We made pretty pretty good. We stopped 
one one time we stopped at a little island, and they come out. People come out in their canoes, and, and we could go topside and water with them. I forget what they had, hmm. but anyway. But we had a we had a that was a good cruise, and uh, our executive officer at the time on the on the segundo, he got his thumb caught in the hatch. Hmm. Took it, took it, took it, hatch took it, and he was running around with bandages like that, you know. But anyway, he didn't go home. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. He stayed with the boat. Now, were these submarines, were these still World War II era submarines? They yeah. had mounted into we, them? We hadn't got into new, new boats yet. Yeah. Okay. Nor we all. Yeah. Now, had you made the decision you were going to make uh, a career out of the Navy at that point? Oh, or? yeah. Okay. When I went back in, I said, this is for me. Yeah. Years. And, like the, I told, I didn't meet Camille until 49, see? 48. 48. 48. <laughs> we got married in 49. Yeah, we got married in 49. 48 I met her. And so I told her that if she's, she had to, we, I was going to stay in. And I was happy in the Navy. So now's the time to say yes or no. She said yes. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, you know, I mean, didn't beat around the bush. And uh, but I, I I I enjoy the Navy. Sometimes you, some of the things they do are crazy, but and uh, anyway. Now through the years in the Navy, you moved up. I'm sure and the technology of the different submarines. Did they get nicer and more? No, I stayed I stayed with the fleet boats. Oh, the did you? Diesel boats. I never got. I never got. I could have got. I could have went on a Nautilus. But it was too much of a hassle. I would had to go move to the East Coast, and we had a house on the East Coast. Oh, okay. And so, and we had my, uh, my mom living with us and stuff like that. It was just too much of a hassle to even think about it. But that's the, that's when they went underneath the North Pole. All oh, right. Okay. So we made you know, the but, ultimate sacrifice. Huh? <laughs> but anyway, that was that was it, and and then I could get on another new boat, one of the new boats, going under the poles too. But it's just that there was weren't located here yet in in Vegas, you know. So it just was was out of the question. You got to do what you got to do, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and we had investments. So we didn't want to leave. Sure, sure. Yeah. So you put in your 20 years. What? When did you retire from the Navy then? What and year? I, in 43, 63. 63? Okay. Yeah. And then? Then I went, I come out, I come out of the Navy, got out of the, we got out of the Navy, and uh, we went back to Norfolk. I had been recruited there for two and a half, two years and a half, two and a half years. And, uh, Went back there and everybody wanted to just come there and stay, you know, and all this stuff. But so one rainy day, rainy night, in the evening, we got down to Columbus, Nebraska, and the road splits. And one goes to the Omaha and one goes to Fort Collins. And so we had to, we're going to do this democratically. Who wants to go this way and who wants to go that way? Three one out, one left out. <laughs> that's the way it worked. But anyway, so we got here, had two kids to get in school. What? We were we came I think either between five days and a week before school. So oh boy. And that's and when we made up our mind where we were going. <laughs> and where we gonna live. And they we were looking at Skyview over here, but it couldn't find nobody to talk to. And so we saw these houses here. There were four houses here, and nothing else was here, practically. There was all there was, but four houses. Yeah, there were four. We were 
Yeah. Four. First one. House second, the basement, third, and next fourth. one was a bylaw. Four houses here. The next here. one was a tri-level, and, so, and then the next one was just a <laughs> house without The houses, everything I wanted. I just got done painting a stupid house in Nebraska, and I didn't want another house. <laughs> I had to paint. I wanted a brick house, and I wanted one with a basement. And it's, this house had a basement, and it had a brick. And I was one of them. And but the only thing was that Leo got mad because he doesn't have, it doesn't have, it, it doesn't have, or Dill doesn't have a lot of storage space in the in this floor. In so this we floor. added the entrance. We added the entrance and one on the back. You know, make floor, make a windbreaker on the back. And in the basement, we got one room in the basement was done. The big room underneath here was done. You know, walls and ceiling and all that was done. But then I actually, when I when I bought it after I bought it, and I knew we were going to. Do we have a heavy piano then or not? Right. The piano then. <coughs> we didn't get the piano until Ripley's room in '76. Yeah. Well, anyway. And we've so I went through. Them, so I guess it's ours. We were so I went through and and doubled all the two by fours going underneath the, the center strip, strip here, because I figured if anything got heavy or anything like that, which it did. And then uh, I had a friend that was a carpenter, lived three doors down, and he helped me build a big wall or closet on the other room over here behind, like underneath the into the kitchen there, oh. right down there. And then when you came here, tell, tell them what you did. Oh, when I came here, I went downtown to J.C. Penney's and bought me, <laughs> bought me a suit. Bought me a suit, shined my shoes and put a shirt on and tie. Went looking for a job. And then I, come across boards there and I went to the school and this one guy had told me about this, about the uh, uh, working for the CSU food service field. But the guy that was doing the hiring wasn't there that day. So I, I heard about awards was doing something, going to move. And so I went over there and talked to the guy and we would, we'd lived, we moved into a motel I don't know yours, La Siesta Motel was right there on College Avenue and we moved into that and uh, no telephone except hotel phone. So you're, you're kind of at a disadvantage. Where do you live? Oh, La Siesta Motel. <laughs> Where's your telephone? <laughs> I don't have one. We just call up the hotel, they'll tell them. And so, I went there and talked to that guy. Told him I, I just got out of the Navy, 20 years, and he said, "Well, okay." He said, "Let me, let me see what to do." And so they get just get ready to move. And so he called me back. He called me up next day. He called me up the next day. He said, "Come to work." And so I went to work right down there where. Uh, Perkins is now. Okay. That building just this side of Perkins. Well, that used to be the Ward's oh. store, one of them. And in the backyard, in the in the drive, in the well, the alleyway, alley there is where I helped started putting bicycles together, you know, and stuff like that. And so that's where I got my start. And then we we went through the Christmas deal. And the guy that was in charge of the sporting goods, he quit. So they put me in charge. I didn't know nothing, but nothing. And then they were selling boats and all that stuff, you know, and motors, and, and they were selling flowers and all that. We struggled through. And then what would happen, my buddy in recruiting, he, well, I, we used to go out to O'Neill, Nebraska, and stay overnight and get to know the kids and stuff like that as much as we could. And then come back the next day, make the round, 
make the, we always call it the circle, makes a circle. And uh, while I was doing that, he sent me out one time on his tour, and, and I said, okay. And so he went and took this postal exam. Then I found out after I got back that what he'd done, that kind of ticked me off. Because he wanted to work at the post office. Yeah. I always wanted to. I had two that was things his in life. <laughs> I had three things in life I wanted to do. I wanted to be a sailor. I wanted to be a postman. And I wanted to be a bum. <laughs> I'm in the bum stage now. <laughs> but anyway, so I went there and awards to give me evaluation day, and I, and so I got found out about the te test. I went and took the test, and then I got a notice from the post office come, come and talk to them. Also, I got a notice from the manager that wanted to evaluate me, and blah, blah, blah. I'm sorry we can't give you a pay raise right now. We're in hurting. And what happened was I found out down in Omaha, I mean Denver, what they were paying the guys down there, what we were getting paid, you know, wasn't right. And so I said, well, who are on you? I didn't know that they could fire me in 90 days either, but anyway, I was, I was going to go for it. Yeah, if they didn't work it out in 90 days at that time, they had a chance they could fire right, me. Right, sure. But after 90 days, you were stuck. You, wah. But anyway. So I got on there, and I hired me in one day as a carrier, the next day I was transferred over to the clerk side, just like that. They had an opening on the carrier side, but didn't have none on the clerk side, but that way they swapped me in. Anyway, that made me a clerk. And, but in those days you could go in at 3 o'clock in the morning, work till 7, 8, start get ready to go home and they say, we need you on this route. They put you on a route for two or three hours and then you come back in and the guy on the afternoon shift had started all the mail, started coming back in. We need you over here, Bill. And you get stuck there. Then you had to go home and go to sleep. Then you had to get back up again at three o'clock. So they could always say what they wanted to, but sometimes the union was a good deal. You know, they start, stop the Stop that monkey mouth, and then they, you could go from about at that time you could go from clerk over to uh, rural carrier and take over rural route. But then I, I didn't I didn't think I'd like that because you had to have two cars all the time in case anything happened. You had to have your car ready to go. It had to be in tip top shape, you know, and, and things like that. I I, I looked at all the the opposites, you know, of what was could could hurt, and so that's why it's, sometimes it's better to stay in one ship and don't sink. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So how many years then all together you put in at the postal service? Twenty. Twenty, another twenty. Wow. I figure four years government service. Yeah. Was enough. I I liked it. I I I liked both jobs real well. That that was one thing I liked about. I liked the post office, and I liked to. Navy, because it, it was a, you got, you got to meet the people. Yeah, yeah. You got to know them. And you know? people come up, well, last year or two they haven't, but people come up to me and say, well, hi, I remember you. No, I'll be done. Because you know, I mean, used to tease them all, and everybody said that they miss them. They still miss them. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but anyway, you know, I mean, you, you have to go to the work with the attitude of enjoying yourself and enjoying the job. The only time I was shaking the shoe was every time I had to take tests. I had to take tests every so often for their accuracy. And I always skim through with this nick in my teeth. <laughs> but I skim through, get through. Uh -huh. But they kept, what was so, what so, so hurting was they, they, they have a habit of every year they, Reevaluate a route, you know. They reevaluate re this route. They add some, or take some out. Then so they, they change the address. Because then they keep changing the address. And you're supposed to remember all yeah. that stuff. Yeah. 
So, like, when I learned it, it was on three. Now it may be on six. Yeah. Now it's on seven. Now it's on five. You know what I mean? It exercised your brain. Well, okay. it did. It exercises it. It's still and, on three. And, and then maybe <laughs> if you're in charge, which he was on the grower of the galley, then your nickname was Ma. Yeah, that's what you had to tell me earlier. The nickname and Ma. In the post office, did he tell you it's Hoppy? Hoppy, Hoppy. Hoppy. <laughs> yeah, you've had a lot of nicknames in your life, huh? Yeah. <laughs> uh, but anyway, the, uh, the, still, I still enjoy it. And then we, the guy, one guy, the, retired, he was a carrier, and he started a breakfast trying to meet the guys and stuff, and so I got in on that, started that, and uh, he died on the golf course one day out there. Playing so he saw something on the golf course. He died on the golf course. Uh, so uh. I took over him and Jim, Joe, uh, Jim Cowan, he took over the carriers, I took over the clerks. So. We do the calling, call up people, and we have once a month we have the breakfast at the Perkins. Oh, wonderful. For the church and carriers. And we try to get them to come and just suit the bull, you know, just have a get together. I, I, I enjoy it. I don't know if they all enjoy it, but anyway, well, quite come. a few come. Yeah. Well, and, along, along those lines, uh, Going back to your Navy years, did you ever have, uh, you still keep in touch with the guys from the from the oh, uh, pilot yeah. fish and have reunions and oh, such? Oh, yeah. 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 We did. Doc, 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 every, uh, yeah, Doc and Doc. Doc took over, and what happened, it started in Denver. They had a convention here in Denver. I didn't even know about it at the time. I think Homer came for it. Huh? He, he was some, the other recruiter was a son man. Yeah. I think Homer came. Yeah. And, uh, Anyway, they got together on the boat, the guys, and so they decided we were going to make it annual, you know. So every year we had one, and that's why all Little Little Rock, Arkansas, okay. uh -huh. all that stuff, you know. Those are the ones we went to the reunion. We had a reunion there. That's where we went. And then they had it. They had it at the main room, reunion, reunions, we'd have a a little side side reunion for us and have our own dinner and stuff like that. And then after the others, we've missed what, about three or four now anyway? Oh yeah, because yeah. no one from the pilot fish is, well except for We Evelyn went to one, the last one was in Detroit. Was we went to that one. And we went that on, we rode the train down to Toledo and, and uh, uh, I had my cousin, cousin, wasn't it? Is he cousin? Yeah, he Cousin, yeah. He doesn't do too well with relatives. He can't remember which one. Anything past my dad, forget it. <laughs> but anyway, we, we uh, went to that one, rented a car, went to, went to that one. And uh, we, that was about the last one that Doc could come to. He lost his wife, and so now he's, he's, uh, well, one of the fellows volunteered to take over. He's by himself. So do you want to know about the what? other citizens? And then, and then, so, uh, the pilot fish, you said, is now, uh, a museum in New York City? No. No, no. The pilot fish is... Pilot the, fish is, that's a museum in, in Utah. Oh, oh, okay. In Utah. See, then it's he, a growler, the last boat I was on. The he last went, boat. Oh, okay, gotcha, okay. The last boat, the Browler. Okay. From the, from the pilot fish to the blower, and then when he went back, he got on the Segundo, and he was on that for two years, and then he got on the char, and he was on the char when I met him. And then uh, he put in for shore duty, and so we I fought the Korean. I fought the Korean War in Memphis, Tennessee. Two and a half, three years. Three years. Three years. Three years. And then they did, They took my designated off, didn't put it on. I wound up on an APA, Attack Personnel Assault, 194. <laughs> Boy, was I. And he had the greatest time, but he complained because he wasn't on summer. <laughs> <laughs> 
Oh, I would, I would do it. What I say, I always feel if you're going to do it, I'll do it, do it right. Try to try the best you can. And it was just one of those deals you try the best you can. But anyway, I, it, was, it wasn't it was bad, but I'm sure yeah. once you get into the AdFib force, boy, it's hard to get out. Is that right? I'll be done. Huh. And the only way I got out of it was they put the stupid thing out of commission. <laughs> and we made the fifth landing. Five years after Anna we talked, so 45, 50. It was in the 50s, then, wasn't it? Well, you know, because we came back in 53, and uh, two weeks 53. later we went on the, that. It was almost nine months western front. You know, we, we went to. And I built, I supervised the house. We had our house built. The folks had built them next door. Anyway, we we made a landing there, and I got up in the morning and looked out. They're on the top side, I looked out. The whole Pacific fleet's there. Everything in the Pacific was there. Uh, outside of Iwo Jima. Cruisers, everything we had out there in the Pacific was there. And the Marines went ashore, and I felt so sorry for them. They come back and they had them move greens on, you know. They had, it's like sandpaper. There, there, around the neck around the belly, around on the boots, laps, straps and stuff. Oh, it uh, felt so hard. We had that black stuff on it, sand on that. We took it, took them in, brought them back out, took them in, brought them back out. And we had that stuff on there when we decommissioned the boat, when we decommissioned the ship, mm. the ship. Submarine the boat and just that. APA to the ship. There's a difference. Yeah. There's a difference. <laughs> <laughs> what else? Well, Bill, we'll start to wind down this interview, but uh, let's talk a little bit about family. Uh, children, grandchildren, great grandchildren? Well, we have uh, Michael, we have Martin, we have Leon, we have Tony. That's it. Four, four boys. Huh? And we also, in um, 79, we started fostering. And did foster, yeah. foster we, parents? Foster parents. Foster that we've had, we did a lot of respite because of our age. They didn't want to give us younger children, so we ended up with, and so um, this is, it, we're, our house has been empty for, I don't know, a couple years now. And that's the only time we've been alone. And we started out taking exchange students. We had a couple of them and a couple of unwed mothers, and so there was an ad in the paper, and I said, well, why don't we start for And I figured that it, a couple of them just stayed overnight, and that we had 42 kids go through. 42 children through foster parent? Oh, my. <laughs> I told uh, we went to John the 23rd uh, for whatever it was, and so they had the, I guess Mother's Day, and they had the women go up. And, so uh, I wasn't going to go with those who were going and so I told Father Don, I said, well, we've uh, had uh, four, four kids and 42 fosters. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> but not at the same time. Yeah, know, yeah, but yeah. That's actually wow. how many. Wow, that's amazing. You know, and we wanted to stay on, but we did a naughty, and uh, this girl was in a real bad situation, and they were going to, they had her checked out of social services. And so it wasn't a good placement, and so she called this lady, and and so she, she couldn't keep her herself, so she wanted to know if we would. And so we went ahead with it without involving the caseworker, and so she got, so when uh, we went to get our 19-year pin, or our clock for 19-year service, and we got the letter in the two weeks, but I wanted to stay on. Can you imagine? these little kids, because we got a couple of them, and uh, they count in the 42, and we got a couple of them, or, you know, the father or whoever they were with had been picked up, put in jail, mm -hmm. and here's this child, and at 2 o'clock in the morning, they're oh. bringing this little kid, and so I went, but I guess it was okay, because by then, Dad needed more help, and so it would have been hard to, probably for him to have foster kids in and out. Well, we did have Jamie, but... Mm -hmm. She was with us a year, and 
Mm. And she loved him and he loved her. <laughs> yeah. She'd always con him out, try to con him out of some of his food. <laughs> <laughs> uh. That was fun. So. Well, then we have. Go ahead. Well, as we, as we wind down this interview, is there anything I didn't ask you that you wanted to talk about? Uh, or any stories that have kind of floated to the top that as we've been talking you wanted to talk about? So hopefully we round out and cover as much of your stories we, as we can, or do you think we've pretty much covered it all? Uh, I, th I think that's about it. Not much. Yeah. You know, it, it, it's so hard to really tell somebody what something's like. Oh, sure. When you're you're not there. Yeah, exactly. Everything oh, sure. Is, it's just, and certain things, you know, that you think about, but it's just your, your thoughts, you know. Yeah. They just don't, they don't gel from somebody yeah. else. Yeah, yeah. But, you know, we've, through the years, and the three years in Tennessee, have you ever lived in Tennessee? It's hot and humid. Yeah. You know, and I think we made so many good friends there, you know, and so I, I think at one point I was sending 200 cards at Christmas, you know. <laughs> you know, that last, last year, I think it was between my authors and all, but so many of them passed away now, you yeah. know, that yeah. our, you know, it was about 60, you know. Yeah. Yeah. But, uh, you know, and I think uh, I was doing, some, when he was at sea, I was doing some, going, and so I went to see this older couple and visited them, and uh, they got one Christmas card from someone, one or two, and that was the highlight of their Christmas, you know? Mm -hmm. And so, you know, so many people are... You know, yeah. And Thoughtless. Our, yeah. And yeah. we kind of, we got Gila, and, and his kids are like our kids, and because he came, he was with us for 13 months, uh, uh, tw yeah, about 12, 12 months and about three weeks. And so then he came back and lived with us the second time. And well, I went to see him, see and got married. So we're kind of like, because Brazilians don't believe in, uh, or aren't too much on giving gifts and stuff. And at Christmas, their big thing is they pack up, the, they used to pack up the whole family and, and had their little uh, campers and they'd go to the beach for Christmas. Hmm. <laughs> So they don't go, they're not into the giving part of it. Yeah, yeah. So we're kind of the grandparents for theirs, but we got the, let's see, we got uh, the, big, the big ones, Leon's, uh, we got his two girls, and they both live here. And then uh, uh, that's her Christmas son is the last one. So we got, uh, Let's see that they three, Tony's three, or Leon's two, and Mike's two, and uh, Martin's got the two now, and uh, then Tony's three, and then that's, how many is that? <laughs> Grandchildren, and then the three great-grandchildren. And then we're gonna have the fourth one, because Whitney's gonna have another one. So let's see, that would be two, four, six, eight, nine. Nine grandchildren? So does that make it right? Two, four. Close enough for government work. Seven, <laughs> well, well, the last question I always like to ask with these uh, in these interviews, Bill, is how do you think those those war years that you went through played a part in your life, affected your life, changed your life, played a role in your life, or did it? Or was it just simply just a chapter in your life you went through? How would you, how would you answer that, do you think? Well, quite a big bit, like a chapter in my life, because from school to the service, there wasn't much in between there, because I didn't, I didn't get much uh, 52, 20, I didn't get much of that. Yeah. So, I, I mean, I think it's that uh, I really grew up in the Navy. What I mean by wise, wise wiseness, or at least I thought I was getting wiser, <laughs> or helping to get wise, and then it 
brought about to the other thing that I could work on and then I figured that later on I would get married but I was shy from getting married too early because I seen too many of those guys that marry me all back east and bring them out to the coast and, and they got to go to sea and here's a poor girl nobody knows, knows her and, and then this she gets in the wrong bunch and the next thing you know it there's a split marriage and it's just it's so many ups and downs and so many things to think about I mean it's, it's a big obligation I don't care what they say and I always look at the service as a job eight to nine job eight to ten job <laughs> sometimes you just had to stay longer that's all <laughs> You know, eight to five, yeah. eight to five. Like three months. <laughs> yeah, you just had to stay longer sometimes. The, the job. But there's a lot of people out there working in the oddball type deal like that, you know. I mean, it's not just a, everybody don't have eight to five jobs yeah. or don't have one they can come home to every night and all that jazz, you know. But, and I think, in a way, a lot of it helped, helped our marriage. Our biggest thing, I think, that helped our marriage is the three and a half years or three years we had in Tennessee, we really got to know each other there. Now there was a eight to, there was a deal that worked every day, every day, either the morning or in the afternoon. The way it worked, the hours worked out. The only time it was off every other week, wasn't it? We had, we had two days off, wasn't it? Saturday and Sunday. Well, you know, and I think part of it was When, uh, before he got married, he was always bringing his buddies home. I mean, up there, maybe three, four on a weekend to his mom's, you know. Mm. After we got married, I mean, sort of the same scenario, you know. And, and uh, I think part of it, we both came from, well, uh, you know, like he was, did you tell me we were in the orphanage for six months? Uh -huh. Yeah. Okay. You know, and I think, he was so used to all these people. He, I think that's why he did so well in the submarine because, you know, he was used to all these people around all the time. And um, uh, with me, you know, I, I used to go to the, we used to go to dances and meet young sailors, and we'd bring him home and invite him to dinner, you know, and stuff. And so our house was. You know, like that too, you know, we were, I was always coming home with someone and and so uh, it was kind of funny because <laughs> I lived with my mom and my maiden aunt and she wanted me to get married but and so some of the one that I <laughs> would bring home she would be ah, you know? <laughs> and so uh, we met on a weekend and um, he tripped over on my feet and I was supposed to go with out with one of the fellows that I worked with and he got a little inebriated so he didn't quite make it which later on my aunt he came by the apartment after we got married and my aunt said it was that was good for you to do that because she really <laughs> slamming it which it didn't matter because you know we were just mostly friends we were just friends it wasn't really anything yeah. serious but anyhow so uh, we met and then he came home and or he came home with me and had dinner and then uh, I had something to do at church, so he went with me, and then, then he came back. For, we came for dinner, and then he took me on the submarine because I pulled in, and uh, or it was tied up at the harbor. And so, on Monday night, then the submarine, and we went to a hockey game on uh, Sunday, and that's the only hockey game we've ever been to. We didn't and always we, watch and it. So either. when, when. Uh, my aunt got home from work on Monday. She says, well, uh, are you going to see him again? I said, I don't know. The submarine left this morning, you know. And so she said, well, if he had proposes to you, you say yes. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be darned. Oh, great story. Yeah. I thought that was pretty funny. And yeah. I said, I shouldn't have married you because she was so opinionated. <laughs> yeah. but, then, you know, so. but I was ready to get married, and I knew what I was going to do. And he figured, up. he figured if I was that old and, you know, I was, I think 
because he was very family oriented. The minute I met him, I heard all about his, his mom and his dad and his little sister and all that, you know. And I brought him home, to, and so he, you know, he met the family. Then he came back, and uh, this was Halloween night. He says, I haven't taken my mask off yet. <laughs> <laughs> so, thanks a lot. Anyhow, so anyhow, then uh, in July, he called, and I was dating a, a soldier at the time. And because uh, we, you know, we both went yeah. on with our lives, and he was in San Francisco. So then he came up in July, and we got engaged. And I went down in uh, October. Well, he wanted me to go a month ahead because he was up. They were up in the yard, and he was trying to make wedding arrangements so we could be married because his dad had had an open leg, and he wouldn't be able to have a vacation. And where I knew my aunt and my mom could come. And we had two cousins in San Diego. So I went and stayed with his folks a whole month before we got there. Wow. So, yeah. you know, so it all worked out. He was up in San Francisco. So we didn't really, you know, but we just figured it was the right thing. So Wonderful. We have this one friend, he said, it should never work, Camilo, it should never work. And it did. <laughs> uh, well, we'll, uh, we'll well, in the, the, the uh, interview, I want to thank you for sitting down to tell your story today, but more importantly, I want to thank you for your service to our country. Thank you, sir. Thank you. I enjoyed getting the pay. <laughs>